Good evening, everyone. My name is Wayne Lamar. I'm the program director for the Master of Science in Athletic Training program here at UNE. And I'm joined here tonight by uh, Professor Christopher Rizzo, who's our coordinator of clinical education for the program, as well as two of our current students, our, our MS2 students, Melissa Aaron Fried and Michelle Barr, who are joining us actually from their immersive clinical experience rotations in other parts of the country. So we're very thankful for them to join and share some of their experiences. And we'll, and we'll be sure to, to give plenty of time for you to ask any questions of them that you might have about their experiences at UNE as a student in the classroom, and of course, out on clinical rotation. We've pulled together a slide presentation for you that just highlights some of the things that we think sets us apart as a program. Um, feel free to jump in with questions at any time, but again, we'll leave some ample time at the end of the presentation for you to ask any questions. And we have a couple of staff members from our graduate admissions office here as well that can provide any specific information about graduate admissions. So let's get started. So the first thing to talk about is um, our outline for the evening. We'll talk about the curriculum. Uh, Dr. Rizzo will talk about the clinical experiences and his role in setting up rotations and sort of what you would expect as a, an athletic training student in the, in the program. I'll also talk to you about experiences beyond the classroom that not only include the clinical experiences, but other things that we do to augment your education, whether it's guest speakers, professional conferences, professional networking, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, truly we're geared, we're laser focused, in fact, on getting you ready to become an athletic trainer. And that only, you know, in includes giving you the information you need clinically and didactically, but also helping you pass your board exam and be successful. Also helping you meet athletic trainers in the area of, of sports medicine that you're interested in working in and network and get those, those opportunities. Um, so we'll spend some time talking about that. There's a piece about the admissions information, and then of course, questions and answers. So for those of you, I mean, I suspect you know this because you're interested in our program, but just in case you're not as familiar, I think you know most people when they arrive at our program, either as an undergraduate student or even sometimes graduate students, they have a pretty myopic or short-sighted view of what an athletic trainer is and does. You know, perhaps you played sports in high school, you had an AT, that you identified with um, that helped you, or perhaps you helped them as a you know work study or just sort of hung out and you developed a relationship and decided this was a great career path for you. Um, we wanna make sure you understand that that's one area of athletic training. We're preparing our students, we hope, we think, for the broad range of athletic training careers in the future. It's not only what, what we would call those traditional settings, high schools, colleges, professional sports, et cetera. There are also many, many other areas that our graduates are working in now. So you know, it encompasses the diagnosis prevention of musculoskeletal injuries, but also medical conditions. And we'll talk about that medical piece in a little bit. I think that's something that sets us apart as a program. You may or may not already know that not surprisingly, the job outlook is outstanding for exercise science and athletic training in general. Uh, older adults are staying active uh, far longer into their into their adult years, um, and the Bureau of Labor and Statistics is projecting uh, our career growth to be ahead of the national average for other uh, careers, certainly even for healthcare careers. So, and we've noticed this even just here in New England. In fact, here in the state of Maine, uh, I've had conversations even in the last two weeks with healthcare administrators that are now realizing that the demand is is outstripping. The, the supply of athletic trainers uh, here in our state. And, and we're, we're finally at a place where I think we will start to see the salaries raise in a commensurate way in the way that we were sort of hoping they would all these years. So I think we're poised really well to provide our students with some great opportunities moving forward. But you'll notice from the bulleted items here that you know there are a variety of settings. It's not just those traditional settings, as I said, but also clinics, sports medicine, cardiac rehab, medical fitness, police and fire departments. We have former students of ours that are working at L.L. Bean in industrial medicine, working for large construction companies in injury prevention and ergonomics training, et cetera. So wide variety. And of course, performance medicine. Uh, Cirque du Soleil has athletic trainers and athletic therapists that work on their staff taking care of performers. Um, so it, it's a wide range of healthcare opportunities. 
You probably also know if you've looked at the University of New England that one of the things that that sort of sells itself about our university is, is the amazing locations that we have. Uh, you know, we our program is, is soon to be the only graduate program on our Biddeford campus, which is our Oceanside Biddeford main campus. Our medical school is the other graduate program that lives on the Biddeford campus for now, uh, but the medical school will be moving to Portland to join the other graduate programs uh, within the next three to five years as they build a new building. Um, but, you know, the combination of being on the coast of Maine and having access to the ocean, uh, all of the amazing resort towns, Kenny Bunkport, uh, Biddeford Pool, and then of course being within, you know, an hour and a half to two hours drive of the ski resorts and the mountains of Western Maine and having access to not only Boston, but also Portland in terms of the healthcare communities and all the other cultural things that, that they offer really, I think, puts us in a, in a great spot. And one of the things that's really grown and changed in the 20 years that Professor Rizzo and I have been here at the University of New England is just the opportunities for students. I mean, there was a time 20 years ago where because we were out on the coast, students felt a little bit sequestered from the rest of Southern Maine, but you know, the UNE has done a great job of, of building networks and transportation opportunities and things, uh, and bringing quite honestly, so many other activities onto campus that the students, it's a much more vibrant community now in terms of what's happening on the weekends. And, and we just had homecoming weekend just uh, this past weekend. And it was amazing, the attendance that we had and the excitement around the athletics uh, that just simply wasn't there 20 years ago when we first arrived. So. We're, we're pretty excited that it, it's a great place to be. Here's an aerial view of the Biddeford campus. As you can see, we're, we're literally ocean ocean front. In fact, many of the dormitories, we sort of joke as faculty and say that they're the Marriott hotel rooms because they've got this gorgeous ocean view in some of the dormitories uh, that you see. Um, <clears throat> there are two sides of our campus. Uh, you can see the larger building I'm not sure if you folks can see my cursor, but the larger building here that I'm circling is our brand new Rippage Commons that incorporates not only student study space, but also uh, relaxation space. There's a pub and game room on the bottom floor. All of our student support services are housed in this one large building. So academic support, um, library services are there, um, counseling services, in addition to dining services. So we really wanted it to be this one place where students could gather and relax and feel like they had all the, the support services that they needed. Our building is on the other side of, of, of Route 9, and I'll, we'll show you an aerial view of that in a moment. Here's another view of the Rippage Commons. You can see the catwalk that connects to our what was our existing library building and connects to the new Rippage Commons. This is the Saco River just beyond that catwalk in the distance, and there's a great dock area as well as a beach area that allows students access for kayaking and, and other recreational things to take full advantage of the river and where it empties out into the Atlantic Ocean. And our Portland campus really is our urban campus. It, it's uh, years ago, the University of New England took over Westbrook College, which was in and of itself a very well respected um, liberal arts college that also had a tremendously strong nursing program and dental hygiene program. When the university took it over, uh, we decided to move, as I mentioned earlier, our graduate programs. So in Portland, it's not only uh, the me medical school, as I mentioned, but also physician assistant, physical therapy, occupational therapy, nurse anesthesia, uh, dental medicine, dental hygiene. So one of the things that we think really helps separate us is this wide variety of other healthcare professionals that you interact with on a regular basis. And that's something that we like to highlight is the fact that many other universities may have the same constellation of healthcare professions, but because of their size or maybe their political structure, they just don't interact in the same way that our students do. I mean, uh, Alyssa and Michelle, the students that are on with us today, they literally were sitting in classes alongside dental hygiene students, nursing students. They got to learn about the curricula for these programs. So they already, before they graduate, have a much greater understanding about what it is, you know, that, that that's required to become a nurse, a PA, a dental hygienist, et cetera, than a lot of people that have been practicing as healthcare providers for three to five years. 
Uh, that's that's one of the hallmarks of UNE is the focus that we put on interprofessional education. And the great part about Portland, of course, is that it, it's it's absolutely on the map now. Uh, you know, the fact that Condé Nast and some of the other elite travel magazines and, and cuisine magazines have have recognized Portland as this rising star in in culture. Um, you know, it, it's one only has to to do a travelocity search on the cost of of hotel rooms to figure out how popular Portland has become as a destination. Uh, so students can take advantage of that now. Um, and particularly in the off season, we sort of get to have Maine to ourselves in, in the fall and winter and spring seasons. Um, so it's fantastic to be able to have that, that close by. And our students regularly interact on both campuses. I mean, we make it a point. In fact, Professor Rizzo is gonna be bringing some of our MS1 students up to the Portland campus uh, later this week to do uh, a simulation lab on heart and lung sounds with our nursing faculty. Um, so we try to regularly interact with the faculty on that campus to make sure that students are comfortable. Here's a view of that Portland campus. As you can see, it's sort of a traditional, it's smaller in size than the Biddeford campus, but it has that traditional quad feel surrounded by the, the, uh, the brick buildings. Um, there is a state-of-the-art simulation center, as I mentioned a, a moment ago. Our biomechanics laboratory, there's a full biomechanics um, motion analysis laboratory that is, is staffed by physical therapy uh, faculty and staff uh, that has a, an eight camera motion capture system, as well as some force plates embedded into the floor where some research is being conducted on a regular basis into things like osteoarthritis. Um, knee injuries, ACL injury prevention programs. There, there are a lot of research projects that the PT faculty and students are doing. And, and the great part for us is that our students could take advantage of that. We not only have graduate athletic training students that have participated in this, but we also have undergraduate athletic training students that uh, you know, can, can work with these faculty members on these research projects that interest them. And several of our students have actually uh, had paid internships over the summer to do some work in the lab. And then that's turned into uh, publications for these students and, and presentations at professional association meetings. So, so we have two pathways. Uh, if you're in this webinar, you're likely interested in the straightforward two-year master's program as compared to our five-year uh, undergrad to grad program. This is exclusively in our Biddeford, Maine location. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we try to be as forward thinking as we possibly can. We know that a lot of the career opportunities for athletic training students um, will not be in those traditional settings. They will be in these other areas that I mentioned to you before. So we try to prepare as best we can the curriculum and the clinical experiences for those kinds of jobs. We try to use technology as best we can, not only in the teaching of what we do in terms of of the use of video and um, the computer technology that we use, but also simulation technology. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We really value this learning alongside these other healthcare professionals. Um, and we make sure that you interact with them on a regular basis. That's literally part of sort of the fabric of who we are as a university. So it's not just something that's done sort of as an afterthought, it's part of everything we do. And we put together the academic calendar for the year we're always thinking ahead to the ways that we can integrate these health profession students so that they can learn about each other as they're learning about their respective careers. Here's a view of our curriculum that's sort of broken out for you in a timeline. Uh, there's a list of these courses, of, of course, on our website, but they're just a linear sort of picture of the classes. I think it's really helpful to get a sense of what your life would look like. And what we've highlighted for you in the sort of green, yellow, green color are the clinical practicum courses because we place a strong premium on clinical experience. Students um, like Michelle and Alyssa will graduate with probably a thousand hours, if not more than a thousand hours of clinical experience working alongside another athletic trainer uh, before they even sit for their board exam and certainly by the time they receive their master's degree. And that's simply because we know from personal experience, and that is Professor Rizzo and I, we know that students learn best uh, out of, on the job training, so to speak. I mean, we'd love to think that they learn most and best from us in the classroom, but that's just simply not the case. We give them the foundation and the basics, and then they go and, and really expand on that. And that's really the beauty of the curriculum is that 
not only are they getting our experience as athletic trainers, but there are at least two to three other certified athletic trainers on our faculty that they're learning from. And then they have at least another three to five clinical preceptors that they're working with learning from. So they're getting five to eight different perspectives professionally, uh, and also five to eight professionals who have a network of their own of colleagues and friends in the athletic training profession to help them land that first job, provide that recommendation, et cetera. Athletic training is a remarkably small world um, when you, especially here in New England, um, in terms of, uh, of, you know, it's a tight knit group. Um, so when we get together for, for professional conferences, I'm always amazed at, at, you know, the ability of our students to network and how those things turn into these first jobs for them. So fall one, you can see is sort of the basics, the introductory fundamentals of athletic training course that includes things like uh, emergency management of spine injuries. We talk about how to properly fit football equipment, how to remove equipment in the case of an emergency. Professor Rizzo teaches an extensive course in the evaluation of musculoskeletal injuries. We also have a general medical conditions course where I teach students about those other things like respiratory conditions when somebody's having an asthmatic attack or how to treat somebody with diabetes and recognize a diabetic emergency, cardiovascular disease, those kinds of things. More of the kinds of things that you would typically see in a nursing or medical curriculum is taught in that course. Spring one of that first year includes physical agents. That's where Professor Rizzo will teach you how to use things like ultrasound, electrical muscle stim, uh, iontophoresis, some of the toys, so to speak, that are used in, in treating athletic injuries. We also programmed in a specific course in clinical reasoning. This is a graduate level program that relies very heavily on evidence-based practice and evidence-based medicine. So to help students navigate that, Dr. Rizzo teaches a course in clinical reasoning where he, he reviews with you and really shares with you the, the way that he thinks as as an experienced clinician and how he navigates the most current evidence and incorporates that into what he does on a daily basis to treat athletes and patients. There's a specific athletic performance and conditioning course uh, that reviews not only um, uh, general fitness principles, but also gets into some detailed strength and conditioning techniques. And many of our students, because of this course, will go on to become CSCS, Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialists. And this course is designed to give you the foundational information to prepare you to sit for that exam if you would like. And we've had great success with our students that have gone on to take that exam in terms of their first time pass rates. Uh, those first time pass rates are, are, are on par with our first time pass rates for the board of certification exam. There's a specific pharmacology course um, because clearly the, the athletes and patients you're gonna be working with are taking medications. Uh, and there's a wide variety of things from obviously cold medications to things like anxiety and depression medications. And it's important for us to understand how to manage those things and how to treat those, those athletes and patients. Then students stay with us for a summer. Um, that's a pretty intense summer. Um, you know, what you'll notice is that there are no specific clinical practicum courses. And quite honestly, that's because many of the schools and high schools and colleges, et cetera, that we send students to are in recess during that summer. That's not to say that clinical experience doesn't happen uh, because Professor Rizzo has and does uh, work with students to, to continue to get them hands-on experience. And we're certainly doing hands-on learning all summer long. We teach a course in rehabilitation to get them ready uh, to, to take care of those athletes once they've accurately diagnosed an injury that may, may or may not need surgery. We teach them how to, how to create a rehabilitation program, how to work with the, uh, the various types of, uh, and, and things that come to mind are joint mobilization techniques. Some of the newer techniques like blood flow restriction treatments and some of these other things they're being taught. There's an administrative at, administration of athletic training programs um, that really helps the students get ready for their first jobs. Uh, some of our students will literally leave us and take a position as a head or assistant athletic trainer at uh, a division one, two or three college or university. And they will all of a sudden be faced with things like budgeting and human resource issues and staffing and hiring, et cetera. So this helps them to understand sort of the business of being an athletic trainer. 
And then manual therapies, that third course in the summer is one that's unique to our curriculum. Uh, and that's a course that we've plugged in simply because we've recognized in the clinical work that we've done, and in particular, the work that I've done with the Olympic uh, ice hockey, women's ice hockey team, I realized that athletic training very much is moving toward a hands-on uh, career path. Um, those ATs that are the most successful are those that have very strong manual therapy skills. So we, we decided to create an entire course devoted to this. Um, so it's building upon those techniques like joint mobilization and adding in other current techniques and, and, um, and theories around how to use your hands to treat the athlete or patient uh, in addition to some of the toys I mentioned before like ultrasound and e-stem. The diagnostic techniques course is also unique to, to UNE in that we realize that uh, whereas 25 years ago, when it was very rare to get an insurance company to authorize a CT scan or an MRI for a musculoskeletal injury, now those things are routine. And our athletic training students really need to understand not only how to basically read x-rays and MRIs, um, but they need to understand just the language, the vernacular of these various diagnostic tests that their patients and athletes are being exposed to. So we're very fortunate in that one of our alums is working in a sports medicine practice here in the greater Portland area, who's got a wealth of experience uh, around this topic, who teaches the full course for us in diagnostic techniques, including things like the use of diagnostic ultrasound. And the great part for us is that his physician practice absolutely loves athletic trainers and has in fact hired about 14 uh, of our graduates over the last uh, you know, several years uh, and allows our students to go in and see patients with the instructor uh, to review things like MRIs, CAT scans, diagnostic ultrasounds, those kinds of things. And then we arrive at fall two, which is exactly where Michelle and Alyssa are sitting now. They're in their graduate seminar with Dr. Rizzo, doing things like getting ready for that first job, thinking about preparing for their board exam, reviewing um, just sort of these, oh my goodness, I'm going to graduate and be a grown up soon kinds of topics. That's part of what that graduate course is designed for. It's flexible in the sense that we really value heavily our students' input. You know, we, we talk to them and find out what they really want, what do they need to be successful. Uh, and then we try to custom tailor that course to really meet their needs. And then really the heaviest part of it is, is the clinical experiences part. And in a moment, I'll, I'll be quiet and let Dr. Rizzo and, and Michelle and Alyssa really talk about what they're doing. Um, but I also wanna just draw your attention to this final semester, which is uh, the spring of their second year. And you can see the psychosocial interventions course, which is a psychology of sport course that's taught by a local clinician who's got years of experience, uh, not only as a division one elite athlete herself, but also as a practicing clinical sports psychologist. Um, so they're really learning about how to recognize those, how to manage and recognize those athletes that are struggling um, psychologically, how to recognize eating disorders, how to recognize suicidal ideations, those things that can really help us um, be incredibly impactful in, in athletes' life. And in fact, save lives by making the appropriate referrals and really knowing what to do in those situations. There's also another clinical experience rotation in that final semester. And you can see uh, also that there's a, a sort of a capstone experience. That's an opportunity for our students to go back to campus. Um, they are required to pull together a clinical poster presentation. We ask them to choose an interesting, uh, complex clinical case from their clinical experiences and present it for us in a, in a professional formal setting, much the way they would if they went to a professional conference, um, just to get them ready because we know that that's what they're gonna be doing once they graduate. And it's also a wonderful opportunity for them to share everything that they've learned with the underclassmen uh, to get them excited about their up and coming clinical experiences. I talked a little bit about the manual therapies course, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time there for you. This also gives you, and you'll see this in the video in a few moments, this gives you a little snapshot of our teaching laboratory. The diagnostic techniques course not only uses <clears throat> excuse me, some of the, um, the, the toys that are available in the physician's office, but we also use our clinical simulation laboratories 
uh, to teach students about some of the diagnostic techniques as well. What you see being used here is one of our uh, wireless uh, 4G simulation mannequins. And again, a lot of universities may have access to this kind of equipment. Um, really the key for us is the fact that this Bill, his name is by the way, Bill actually lives in, in, in a storage closet literally down the hall from our teaching laboratory. Bill is ours to use whenever we need to have access to him. Um, our faculty have been trained in how to set Bill up and operate him using a laptop computer. And what you're noticing here is a still shot of a listening laboratory where students were taught about cardiovascular pathologies and respiratory pathologies. Then they were taught how to auscultate using a stethoscope uh, for normal heart and lung sounds on each other in lab. But of course, what we really need them to understand is what's abnormal. So the beauty for us is that we can take a simulation mannequin like Bill and we can program in things like pneumonia and bronchitis and other types of pathologies and the sounds that go along with them so the students can begin to recognize um, this is not normal. This is something that I need to make an appropriate referral for further evaluation by a physician or another qualified healthcare professional. Uh, you know, I, I need to catch this before it becomes worse. That's the value of having the simulation mannequins. And, and the other wonderful thing is that we can set things like a very precise blood pressure for Bill, a very precise heart rate for Bill, and really get a sense as to whether or not our students have their skill sets. Are they really able to accurately take a blood pressure? Are they accurately able to recognize a heart rate? And of course, there are various pulses that we can control with Bill as well. Uh, unfortunately, these mannequins are not designed well enough yet for musculoskeletal simulation. So we've got some task trainers for that. But in terms of the general medical conditions that we we try to teach our students about, he's really valuable in that sense. And again, he's ours to do to do what we will with. And in fact, I'll have Dr. Rizzo talk about some of the cool things we've done with him in the past. In fact, Dr. Rizzo, why don't you talk about the critical case scenario that you set up and sort of the kinds of things that we plan to do with this? You might be on mute. Go ahead and try again. At least I can't hear you. Oh, thank you, Professor Lamar. Thank you. <laughs> so this is a, a simulation that we designed um, a couple of years ago where we took uh, one of those mannequins. It wasn't Bill, it was his brother. And we actually dressed him in hockey equipment. And then we simulated an on-ice cervical spine injury. And so what you're seeing there is you're seeing the head athletic trainer maintaining inline stabilization. You're also seeing assistant athletic trainer there as well as two of our students who are simulating an emergency action procedure. And what you don't see on this picture is uh, the local EMS service. And so we had local EMS that came in, we spine boarded this uh, simulator and in the process of spine boarding the simulator, uh, there was a gentleman that you could see there in the uh, in the penalty box, and he was controlling uh, the pulses and actually made the simulator go into cardiac arrest. And so they not only had to worry about spine boarding this mannequin, but now they had to manage the cardiac event. And so uh, it was a great simulation overall. Uh, it was an opportunity for the uh, the faculty and the the staffing for the Harold Alfon Forum, which is where our, our ice arena is, to work on emergency action plans, to kind of work on tweaking. Well, who is responsible for calling, and and where is the best place for the ambulance to pick up uh, an an injured athlete? And so, it was a it was a great opportunity. Going back all. Also, to what Lamar talked about earlier, with respect to interprofessional. And so we had EMTs, we had physicians here, we had athletic trainers. And so it was a, it was a really awesome opportunity to just not only teach, but also impact patient care in the forum. And the other great part about that, as I mentioned earlier, is that many other universities will have access to a simulation man mannequin like this, but I guarantee you very few are going to let you 
take a thirty-five or forty thousand dollar mannequin and sort of you know put it through what we put it through. So it just shows the trust that they have in Professor Rizzo as a as a faculty member, and, and they understand the value of this education experience for our students. So. So I'll let you continue, actually, Dr. Rizzo, and talk about the clinical experience piece. Awesome. Well, you know, one of the two of the things that we're really incredibly excited about when we transitioned to the master's degree was, first and foremost, the didactic coursework that Professor Lamar just outlined to you. The other piece that I'm incredibly excited about is are the opportunities that our students now have for clinical experiences. And prior to our transition to the master's degree, I was forced as a coordinator of clinical education to keep our students within a 30 to 45 minute radius of campus because they were having to come back to take coursework. Now, as we've transitioned, students are local for the first two semesters, but in the fourth, the third semester, which is where uh, Alyssa and Michelle are right now, they have the opportunity to go absolutely anywhere. And so the graduate uh, seminar course, as well as the psychosocial course that Professor Lamar talked about in the fall and in the spring semesters, those are 100% online, which means that the students can go absolutely anywhere. And, and I can't begin to tell you how excited I am about the opportunities that this has created for our students. Right now, I have 10 students who are out on their clinical rotations, only one of which is within 45 minutes of campus. We have students that are out at Stanford University. Uh, we have students that are at, down in Florida. We have students that are in Texas. Alyssa is in Washington, D.C. We'll let her talk a little bit about her experience here in a second. Michelle is in North Carolina. So all of these students have taken opportunities to actually go away from campus and get a, what is called an immersive clinical experience. And just to give you a little bit of a background on our accreditation standards, our accreditation standards say that this immersive experience, which means it needs to be unopposed, no in-person sit down in classroom didactic component. It has to be unopposed at a minimum of four weeks. And so that's what our accrediting body, the Commission on Accreditation of Athletic Training Education tells us. We have extended that to 14 weeks. And so our students now will have in the fall an opportunity to get a completely 14 week unopposed immersive experience. And that is absolutely outstanding. The other really kind of cool piece of this is that they will have an opportunity in the spring because of the way that we've, we've created our coursework because that psychosocial course will only be online both in a synchronous and asynchronous format, which means that there is a time where students will meet online in person, but then there's also an asynchronous component, which means that they can do work outside of a designated time frame. And so what that has allowed our students to do is that has allowed our students to, in addition to doing one immersive rotation, either one, stay at that clinical site for a second immersive rotation, which we have a number of students who have already, even this early on in the fall, they have already committed to staying on in the spring. Or if the student so chooses, they can actually go someplace else. And I'm working right now with Alyssa, for example. She's going from Washington, D.C. to Washington State. So she's crossing the country for her spring rotation uh, out at the University of Washington in Seattle, which is, again, an opportunity that our students would never have had the opportunity to, to take a hold of had we stayed at the baccalaureate level. Our students just did not get those clinical experiences. And so um, I, I can't tell you how excited that makes me to be able to send our students uh, away all over the country. And it's even not even right now, we have students that are within the United States, but there's nothing to stop us from sending students um, abroad either during these, during these two semesters if the opportunity arose. But I'll, I won't take any more thunder away from Michelle and Alyssa. I'll let them tell you about their, uh, their clinicals. I'll go first. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Alyssa. I am currently at Gallaudet University in Washington, DC. It is a deaf and hard of hearing division three um, college. 
So I'm working mainly with the football team and my main form of communication is American Sign Language. So I was able to take a small like online course over the summer to help myself with, um, with sign language. But other than that, I was just fully immersed into the language and have learned a lot. I am still not at the point of being fluent, but it is actually pretty cool that I can stay in a conversation and sit there for hours upon hours of people only using sign and actually understanding everything that's happening. Um, I've been able to do everything that any other athletic training student has been able to do. I do my evaluations, I talk to my preceptor, and I've learned so much. I, I can't even explain how much I've learned. She's been absolutely amazing. My preceptor is hearing, so I've been able to talk to her, but I have another, the other football athletic trainer, he is completely deaf. Um, so I've gotten to learn a lot of different things from his perspective. And I only have learned it through sign, which is crazy because that's how now I think about it in my head is only in sign language, not through words or through pictures. It's only in sign. So that has been awesome. So now I've learned different techniques, evaluation techniques, um, different testings, manual muscle tests that I couldn't remember of or learning something new and I can only see it in sign language. So that has been very, very cool. Um, I have loved it so far. Um, it has been amazing. It drains my brain every day because I'm learning athletic training and I'm learning a new language. But the way that I've improved my athletic training skills and really challenged myself, it's been amazing. I am so happy that I've gotten the opportunity to go, like um, Professor Rizzo said, out somewhere that's not 35, 40 minutes away from campus. I can actually try and do something that's out there and crazy, even though it's division three and our football team even played University of New England. Um, it's still something that is way out, way, way, way different experience than I thought that I ever had. But with that, it is still um, a smaller school. It's not as um, competitive. There's not a lot going on other than the football team. So once it comes to springtime, I talked with my preceptors and I talked with Professor Rizzo and family. And I was like, I want to try another experience somewhere else, um, specifically division one, just to see what that's like. Cause I've only ever had a high school experience and then D3 college. So might as well try to travel across the country and do something new. And the next farthest place was Washington state. Um, so that's my, that's my next, that's my next stop. I have an interview soon and hopefully that'll be my, my next uh, immersive <laughs> rotation. Yeah. All right, Michelle, all you. That was great. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Michelle. I am a second year master's student. I am currently in my immersive portion of my education um, in North Carolina at Davidson College. Um, it has been a whirlwind of an experience. I was always someone who was a homebody, so traveling outside of New England was totally new for me. Um, but I was very excited to do that, and I've had nothing but a great experience. Um, like Alyssa, I am also working with football. Um, it's a D1 division program, and so um, it's been a whole lot different than my previous high school experience. A lot more hours. We're also traveling a lot. Um, I'm getting ready to head up to Minnesota this weekend, where the high is supposed to be 50. <laughs> so I thought I was getting away from the cold, but I guess I'm headed back again. Um, but I have had so many new experiences. I feel like everything is starting to come together. Uh, today, I got to remove uh, stitches from some of our uh, post-surgery patients, and I've got a lot of hands-on with the um, brand new rehab for these uh, patients who have gotten um, ACL uh, repairs, labral repairs in their hips. Um, so it's a whole different ball game than I've experienced um, up in Maine with the high school experiences I got, which were, you know, those are amazing too, but I'm starting to really feel like I'm getting into the profession here. Um, I get to work Outside of football, I've been working a lot with volleyball and some of the basketball team, um, really with everyone. Each athletic trainer has really taken me on and um, helped me a lot in my progress towards getting more comfortable with my rehab skills. Um, 
you know, every day I'm doing an eval and when I get it right, I get so excited because I feel like, oh, my education went to something. So it's really been a great experience so far. Um, I haven't had the unique experiences Alyssa's had with learning a new language or anything, um, but it's definitely a whole new ball game where I feel like I'm learning something every day, um, learning new techniques that we didn't really get in education. Today we did a combo therapy, which is ultrasound plus stim at the same time. Um, so it was, it was, it's just a great experience to get out there and really learn something new. I'm going to stay for my second semester. Um, in the spring before I graduate, uh, hopefully working with either track or women's lacrosse, which will be different. I definitely enjoy women's lacrosse, but track will be a whole new experience because sometimes it's not so much a traumatic injury. It um, can be a long-term you know, injury that you get to find uh, out later on that's not so much acute from you know, a collision with a huge linebacker. So it's a new ball game and I've been so thankful that Professor Rizzo and Professor Lamar can make this happen for me. Thank you, ladies. Well done. Glad you're having such a great experience and continuing to represent us as well as, as you always have. So this is a shot of the Harold Alphon Forum, which is our home. Uh, we're incredibly spoiled in that we have the state-of-the-art facility. It, it's less than 10 years old. And really the great piece about the forum for us is that we had a hand in its design. And that is to say that when we knew that we were gonna be moving across campus, so to speak, into this new area uh, and building the facility, they came to us as faculty and asked us really what we needed and wanted in our teaching laboratories, in our classrooms, and the access to some of the things. And, and if you haven't had an opportunity to visit with us in person, I highly suggest you do. I think you'll be quite surprised, as just about everybody is, at the quality of facilities that we have for a Division three institution, um, the strength and conditioning space, the ice arena, and some of the other things you'll see in uh, the video in a moment are really more commensurate with a Division II or Division I institution. Um, and, and it's just great uh, that we have such access to it. And this is also where all of our academic and, and um, staff offices are. So this one building, uh, as Michelle and Alyssa will attest to it, you spend a lot of time in, in the forum when you're an athletic training student. So this is a brief video that we did just to give students who don't have the opportunity to come to campus an opportunity to see the spaces where you'll be learning and congregating, so I'll play the video for you now. Hi, I'm Wayne Lamar, the University of New England. And I'm here on our bidder for campus to show you the facilities for our Master of Science in Athletic Training and Applied Exercise Science program. Let's go. These programs occur primarily within UNE's athletic facilities here at the Harold Alphon Forum. The forum sits next to UNE's blue turf football field, the softball diamond, the rugby field, and recreational track. And inside are the ice arena, multi-sport gymnasium, and strength and conditioning room. Students in both programs work daily with athletes to apply what they learn in real time. And they also have access to some amazing lab spaces and equipment. So this is our varsity athletic training clinic. This space is where our students work side by side with staff athletic trainers to take care of our varsity athletes. You can imagine, for example, this area would be teeming with activity before a practice or a game to get athletes taped and wrapped. This area is where athletic injury treatment and rehabilitation occurs. And over here is the cryo and hydrotherapy area. There's a warm whirlpool, a cold whirlpool, and of course, all the coolers and equipments to make sure the athletes are properly hydrated. This is our AT teaching lab. It's a smaller version of what you saw downstairs in the Varsity Athletic Training Clinic. And you notice it's directly connected to the classroom. You also notice some of the same pieces of equipment that you saw downstairs, ultrasound, electrical muscle stim. We have emergency medicine pieces of equipment, things like spine boards, rehabilitative equipment, like the ankle platform system that you see there. And here, anatomical models that we use not only to teach our students, but also to educate patients that come in for care about their injuries. So the space is designed to be exactly what it looks like, a smaller self-contained version of an athletic training company. This is our applied exercise science lab. 
This is where students use the equipment you see here to learn how to do full physiological testing, like pulmonary function tests, cardiac stress testing, and EKG. They also learn how to draw blood safely to measure things like lactic acid levels in patients and athletes' blood. And it's also connected directly to the classroom. And this allows students to go from theory to practice seamlessly. And this is our dedicated research lab. This is a place for students who work on faculty-led projects using equipment like the negative 80 freezer that you see here, where we store biological samples, things like blood that's now being drawn in our concussion prevention study. We have wireless EMG sensors. You can see the sensors there that correspond to this jig on the wall that's used to measure neck strength and reaction time. And one of the most exciting pieces of equipment in this room is the DEXA unit that you see here. This is a bone density scanner that we use to measure body composition and bone density. This is a piece of equipment that you'd really only see in large universities, research hospitals of that nature. Students also have access to even more science and learning facilities across the campus. All right here on the coast of Maine. I really hope you'll come and visit us in person sometime soon. Thanks for watching. Excellent. Let me escape out of this now and get back to our presentation. So we talked a little bit about the research projects. And again, here's a sampling of some of the things that have been done in the past, not only the body composition that I mentioned, but also sport-related concussion, altitude physiology. We did an interesting study during the pandemic of the effects of wearing masks multiple masks at a time versus just a single mask and how that actually felt versus physiologically what it really did um, to, to patients and athletes. We also have the teaching research lab that I mentioned. I talked with you earlier about the motion analysis lab on our Portland campus. And this final bullet item down at the bottom is this interprofessional injury care clinic where Dr. Rizzo has partnered with faculty from our medical school and medical students to help evaluate athletes who are participating in intramural sports on campus. Um, we wanted to provide them with some expert care that uh, they wouldn't necessarily have access to as non-varsity athletes. And of course, it's a great opportunity for our students as well as the medical students to learn right alongside faculty. I mentioned to you earlier how tight-knit a community athletic training is. We try to, to immerse our students in that community. And this just gives you a sense of some of the fun things we've done as an athletic training club. You can see Alyssa and Michelle, for example, down in the picture in the bottom right at an athletic training conference. We regularly bring our students to professional conferences, as I said, to help them to network and learn along with other athletic training students. In the upper left-hand corner is a picture of uh, the students when we went up to Montreal Quebec, Canada, to visit Cirque du Soleil's International Training Center to teach them about performance medicine and athletic training. We happen to catch a Cirque performance under the big top there. You can see in the background. The bottom left picture shows Dr. Chris Nowinski, who's uh, the director of the, of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Um, we brought him in as a guest speaker, and that's something that we do quite regularly. Uh, the, the students uh, fundraise and use those proceeds to help offset the costs of bringing in world-class speakers to Biddeford, Maine, to, to speak to our students about current sports medicine topics. In the center picture on the bottom, you can see myself and a group of students that uh, volunteer just about every year at the Maine Marathon. We help to provide medical support along with nurses and physicians to the runners and athletes. And in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a large group of us that visited the um, United States Olympic Training Center at Lake Placid, New York. Because of the connection that I have with the U.S. Women's National Team, we were actually able, we were the only university group to be able to actually stay in the village along with athletes, meet with USOTC staff, that is athletic training staff, strength and conditioning staff, learn about what it takes to sort of get to that level, meet with some of the athletes that were training and staying there in the village. And, and we, we just had a great time also taking in all that Lake Placid had to offer at that time of year. So we, we would be remiss if we didn't mention to you um, what I hinted at earlier when I talked to you about the Rippage Commons, and that is that, you know, one of the things that's really special about UNE is its size and the fact that 
there's a tremendous amount of support. I mean, and what I tell prospective students and parents all the time is that you really have to work hard to sort of fall through the cracks at UNE. Um, you, you develop really close-knit relationships with faculty, with staff, and, and there's a tremendous amount of, of, of people around that want you to be successful. And we've made great strides in creating expert centers, for example, the Academic Success Center that's staffed with education experts that are experts in study skills, test-taking techniques, uh, in addition to helping you organize notes, et cetera. Uh, we have the Student Access Center for those students that have learning style challenges uh, who have a tremendous uh, a network of support there. There's a career services office that helps you with resume writing, interviewing skills, um, networking on sites like Indeed and other kinds of things. Of course, counseling services and the Student Health Center, those types of things that you would typically see on every college campus to help you support, to help support the emotional and physical health of our, our, um, of our students. And then you've got faculty support, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, you've got practicing researchers, clinicians um, who are here. You know, the great part about univer the University of New England is that both Professor Rizzo and I you know, our primary goal is teaching. You know, we, we, if we do research, it's because we are interested and we dabble in it. It's not something that is our primary mission as faculty members. What we came to you and need to do and what we do on a daily basis because we love it is teach the students. Um, so there's a, there's a great support network for those people. And then, of course, everyone wants to know about outcomes. Uh, and, and we're incredibly pleased that uh, our current first time pass rate for our graduate students is 100% uh, because every student that comes through our program needs to pass the board of certification exam before she or he can become licensed and practice athletic training. So we have, have taken great pains over the last five to eight years to really understand the exam and prepare our students as best we can for it. And it, and it shows in our outcomes. So students get supported with as many practice examinations as they need, study sessions as they need. We provide them with all of the materials that, um, in terms of textbooks and other things that, that the exam questions may be pulled from. We make sure that we have a repository of all those things in the library for them so they have access to those things. Um, and many of them, as you see here in the bullet, will choose to take that exam before they even get their degree. Many of them want to take their exam as early as February, April, or March of that final semester. Um, and, and if they pass their exam, which statistics say that Michelle and Alyssa will, then they're already ready to go. Once they complete the degree in May, they'll be ready to take that first job and begin in July or August of that following summer. So we're excited about our pass rates. Here's an example of some of the places our graduates have gone on to, and they include professional sports organizations at various levels. They include industry, Amazon, for example, ergonomics training and injury prevention, LLB, as I mentioned before. I talked to you already about the main medical partners, sports medicine, uh, and quite a few of our graduates are working in, in again, what we call those, those emerging practices in athletic training. And here's our application timeline. For students who are interested in starting in the fall of 2023, the application portal in the Athletic Training Centralized Application Service, and the link and information for that can be found, of course, on our website. That portal opens up June 30th. The priority application deadline is December 1st, and the final application deadline is May 15th. Once students upload their information through the ATCAS portal, that information then gets funneled through our graduate admissions office and vetted, and then it comes to program faculty like myself and Dr. Rizzo. We review application materials, including essays, uh, prior coursework, et cetera. Uh, and then students who are qualified are invited to interview. We typically do Zoom interviews because we, again, understand that it's not always easy for someone to come in person and meet with us. So we'll conduct Zoom interviews for those students. And if they're accepted, then they begin in the fall. Here's the information that you need to know in terms of prerequisite coursework. You, you can see that you know, we recognize that um, 
you know, athletic training is as much of an art as it is a science. Therefore, we don't really want to place unrealistic um, requirements on students in terms of exceptionally high GPAs or classes. We're happy with a C or better in these courses in anatomy and physiology, exercise physiology, kinesiology, and then chemistry and physics. We ask that you have a cumulative grade point average of 2.5 or better, and then two letters of reference. I'll pause there and open it up for questions for you. I'm mindful of the time because I know that it's already eight o'clock. And remember that I can't see you. So if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and jump right out and ask it. And remember too, that our information is available on the website and also at the end of this presentation. So you're always welcome to send us an email question and we're happy to get back to you about that. forward to the next screen. Just to let you know that we have an upcoming event happening on November 17th. And that will be a careers in athletic training virtual panel event. And then there's an open house on November 12th. Here are the contact information points that I mentioned. Again, feel free to reach out to either myself or Dr. Rizzo. Dr. Rizzo, thankfully, is our Instagram guru. So you're all, we also would love to have you follow us on Instagram. We try to post as many pictures as we can of the great things that our students are doing on a regular basis. And then, of course, you can reach out specifically to Sarah Bedell in the Office of Graduate Admissions. Sarah helps to coordinate our program. Uh, she's a great resource in terms of application processes, deadlines, answering questions about prerequisite classes, et cetera. So I'll also offer up Sarah as a resource for you. Here, by the way, is the view off of our Biddeford campus looking at Camp Ellis. This is the mouth of the Saco River. Pretty great study space for students and a good place just to go and relax and reflect. I'll pause another minute or so for questions just to make sure that I don't cut anybody off who's thinking of one. And I want to make sure I thank Michelle and Alyssa again for sharing their experiences today. It's great to see you. We miss you having you on campus every day. So miss you guys. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thanks very much for joining us tonight. And again, we encourage you to come and visit us in person if you can and certainly reach out with any additional questions that you might have.